I invite us now to attend to the reading and hearing and receiving of our Scripture lesson this morning taken from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I'm reading from the twelfth chapter, verses 1 through 13. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them in every one. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit." This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, Your servants wait upon You, and we pray that the words we speak, the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in Your sight, for You are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Today's passage from Paul is a good one, a very good one, to help us understand and celebrate the body of Christ, the church. It may be particularly timely for those of us who are in that uh, connection we call the United Methodist Church, where just now we're caught up in a season of discerning and even dissension and contention, and words like disaffiliation are now being bandied about, where certainly in my lifetime and maybe, maybe several generations prior, you just didn't hear that word very much in relation to our church, the United Methodist Church. Just yesterday, we ha- held a uh, session, a virtual session. It's all done by Zoom. Bishop Ken Carter and other conference leaders walked us through the uh, vote that we needed to take as an annual conference, uh, dealing with 192 churches out of 950 churches in our annual conference who have gone through the process and taken their individual votes as a, as a church to disaffiliate from our denomination, and therefore from our annual conference. Uh, This is a a contentious time, a a concerning time, a time when we are invited to reorient ourselves, re-engage ourselves with Paul's teaching that he comes back to again and again and again, speaking of the unity of the Holy Spirit 
a variety of gifts given to all God's children, but from the one Lord, one faith, one Spirit, one God. Unity, not disunity. Moving ahead together, connected together like a human body with many parts, but all of them valuable, all of them needed, all of them belonging. One body we are called into. Paul makes it clear to the Corinthians that the source of all their gifts and anyone's spiritual gifts is the Holy Spirit. In fact, says Paul, no one can, can touch, uh, in touch with the Spirit can curse Jesus, and only by the power of the Holy Spirit can one say Jesus is Lord. So if you've professed that in your faith, as we all do, you have been in touch with and under the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is Lord. Paul goes on to give examples of spiritual gifts. This list is not meant to be comprehensive. These are examples. There are others that are not listed there. And so I think we, we get in trouble when we try to overanalyze and, and overpick apart these particular gifts that Paul lists here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. His key thought is, is the unity of the one Spirit. While our gifts and our personalities and our talents and our interests and our preferences may vary, the Spirit remains the same. That's what calls us together as the church. That's what keeps us together as the church. When we follow that Holy Spirit, we are together. When we stop following that Holy Spirit or listening to that Holy Spirit, we tend to come apart at the seams. We get frayed. We get contentious. We get anxious. We come apart. And if the Spirit is consistent and is the source of our gifts, which Paul affirms, then we have no room to brag. That is, says Paul, we have no right to think more highly of ourselves than we ought spiritually, as if some of us are graduate-level Holy Spirit receivers and others just aren't quite there yet. No, no, says Paul, we have no grounds to look down on the gifts of another. If you go on and read further in Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul even goes so far as to say, uh, the hand can't say to the eye, I don't need you. The the, The mouth can't say to the foot, I don't need you. We're all part of this one thing. We're together. This seems to be for us, I know it is for me, a hard lesson to learn and to remember. We humans are prone to think that the way we do something, the way we think about something, the way we solve a problem or approach life is the best way or even the only way. In our ignorance and narrow-mindedness, we often become the cause of our own bigotry or hatred or fear or even war. Why do we struggle so to honor the gifts that God has placed in others? Is the respect we so desire from others any less deserved by those who are different from our family, our group, our culture, our tribe? No, says Paul, no. In fact, he goes to great pains again and again to his letters, in his letters to the churches, to remind us of that. We're no longer slave or free. We're no longer Uh, Jew or Gentile or Greek? No, no. We're all called by this Holy Spirit to be followers of Jesus Christ. We are made one, and we are together in that oneness. Thank God Paul wrote letters to believers and churches in different cultures all over the known world. Thank God He encouraged Christians to be examples of respect and tolerance and love and kindness among themselves and to those they encountered when they ministered in the world, when they preached, when they taught, when they established churches, 
when they welcome new believers into the life of faith. Those were the bywords of the early Christian church. And Paul knew that as humans, we sometimes would fall away from such words as love and kindness and welcome and respect and dignity. We would forget that we're all made in God's image. We're all precious children of God. And so he would remind us of that again and again and again. You see, Paul knew this secret that we can all benefit from knowing as he wrote and encouraged and challenged the, the new Christians in, in, in churches in Corinth and Thessalonica and Ephesus and Galatia and Rome. He reminded them over and over that they need each other. We need each other. When I was much younger, I questioned the truth of this thought. In fact, my dad used to tell us, if you want something done right, do it yourself. Anybody else ever hear that when you were growing up? If you want something done right, do it yourself. He was probably frustrated with somebody he'd hired to do something in, at the house or in the yard or whatever. And in a hundred subtle ways, I picked up on the idea that being self-sufficient was a goal to which I should aspire. I picked up the thought that being able to go through life and not really need anybody was somehow a good thing, I thought. But then life got in the way of that, and I began to realize as I grew up and grew older that that notion was a lie. I learned this lesson in several ways. The first lesson, the first way that I learned this is, is sitting right here. Jenny, I'm not trying to pick on you, but I learned this through uh, getting older and realizing that I wanted love in my life. I wanted to offer love in my life through marriage. And so as I fell in love and discovered more about love as an adult, I realized that truly sharing in marriage or friendship or family includes depending on and trusting in someone else. You can't be truly self-contained if you're going to give love or accept love with another person. And there's the tension, you know? There's the tension we all feel because we want to be that self-contained person, meet all of our own needs and so forth, but then we find that for life to be full and complete, to be a family, to be a marriage, to be a friend, to be in relationship at all, we've got to make room for another person's terms, another person's way of loving, another person's priorities, another person's interests, another person's humanity. So you can't be truly self-contained if you're going to give love or accept love you're going to need each other and count on each other to provide support and care and affection and companionship and wisdom that you can't provide all by yourself. And so we, we grow into that. We, we're always learning how to do that better, but we acknowledge the importance of it. The second lesson came from trying to be a, a minister, trying to be a, a called, ordained clergy person in Christ's name. I'm still learning how difficult, I would say impossible it is, to be in ministry without relying on and with and counting on and depending on and cooperating with others. Like Paul says, we are all given various gifts. No one gift or person is endowed with everything the world needs or the church needs. We're meant to work together. We need each other to be complete. The fact is that it's only as we recognize that we are one body in Christ that we can be the church. Only as we realize we're all fed and nourished by that one Holy Spirit and that each of us has the same relationship to that Spirit and to each other in the life of the church that we can realize the image of Christ in our serving and in our life together. That's why 
Paul's lesson today from Corinthians is so important and a good one for all of us as we live into each chapter of our lives, as we live out this particular chapter in the life of the United Methodist Church, to see how we're going to step forward, to see how we're going to ask those deeper questions about who we are, who we want to be, how we'll move forward in ministry in our community, who we'll welcome through our doors, how we will relate to one another and to our greater, wider world. We need each other. The following advice has been shared before by others. It's not exactly what Paul is trying to tell us, but I think he would agree with it. It's good advice for all who seek to honor God in their living and in their loving. A corporate uh, lecturer, kind of a motivational speaker, was addressing a group of pretty high-powered business executives, some of them with more experience than others. But all that type A, hard-driving energy just filled the room. And, and so the uh, lecturer began by uh, acknowledging a glass of water on the small desk beside the podium up on the stage. And he actually picked it up and held it up and set it down and asked his audience, how much do you think this water weighs? How heavy is this glass of water? And so the answers came out, oh, it's no more than a pound or this many grams or that many grams. And the, 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 the answers ranged widely. And the lecturer thanked everybody and said, well, the absolute weight of this water doesn't really matter. It depends on how long you try to hold it. He said, if I pick up this water and hold it for about one minute, I'll be okay as long as I can set it down. But if I pick it up and hold it for an hour, my arm is going to really ache. If I pick it up and try to hold it all day, you'll have to call the paramedics. I'll need medical attention. In each case, it's the same weight, but the longer I hold it, the heavier it becomes. We could add the longer we hold it without any help, the heavier it becomes. And that lecturer went on to say, that's the way it is with stress and life and anxiety and the burdens that we tend to carry. If we carry those burdens all the time without any help, sooner or later, as the burden becomes increasingly heavy, we won't be able to carry on. Sometimes, as with that glass of water, you got to put it down for a while and or get some help with it and get some rest before trying to hold it again. When we're refreshed, we can carry on with the burden. And then he went on to share some rather humorous observations about dealing with the burdens of life. He said, you know, you got to accept that some days you're the pigeon and other days you're the statue. You like that? Yeah, I've got those days when I'm the statue for sure. Accept always to keep your words soft and sweet just in case you have to eat them. If you can't be kind, at least have the decency to be vague. <laughs> it may be that your sole purpose in life is simply to serve as a warning to others. I like that. I spend a lot of my time as a warning to others. And finally, this one is so great. It's for our kids too. You know, we can learn a lot from crayons. Some of them are sharp, some of them are dull, some are pretty, some have weird names, and all of them have different colors, but they all live in the same box. Hmm. I guess we'll always have all those folk who are negative, who see the glass half empty, who are always so quick to point out what's wrong with the church, what's wrong with me, with you, with the world, with most anything. They whine and they complain and they grumble. And as Jesus said, they often cast burdens on other people that they themselves are not willing to carry. Truly, says Jesus, they have their reward. But you, he says to 
us, we who would follow him? You pay attention to my Father's Holy Spirit. When you pray, pray in secret. My Father will notice. When you give alms, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. When you fast, wash your face. Put on your best clothes. Don't make a big scene about it. In other words, know why you're doing what you're doing and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you and call you. And when you follow that Spirit, you'll be on the right track, says Jesus. You know, most of us are only too well aware of what we don't have and what does not work, what fails, and all the pain and misery life can bring. But when we remember and choose to live as followers of the Lord of life, we find that we are gifted and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We trust in a God who finds and heals and loves and saves and calls us to take that spirit towards life, that attitude, that perspective. Let, that, let those be our marching orders to be in the business of welcoming and finding and healing and loving, and saving. And all the rest, says Jesus, will find its place. Let that Spirit guide your heart and your mind and your soul. Amen and amen.